going to kick off a timer because I know I haven't got too much time. So we're going to talk about securing containers by breaking in. And during this session, these 15 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about seven best practices that will help you secure your container images. And we'll hopefully also have time for two live hacks. So let's jump in. I'm the VP of Developer Relations and Community at SNCC. I've been here about two years. We're hiring in the DevRel team as well. So if, if you're interested in containers and things like that, do contact me and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. So number one, one of seven, prefer minimal base images. Why? Because base images and parent images contain a lot of vulnerabilities. This is the top 10 uh, most downloaded images from Docker. And you can see the vast number of images uh, that contain 30 or more vulnerabilities. It is absolutely critical to choose the right base image as we will inherit all of the vulnerabilities that pull in from there. Number two, least privileged user. The principle of least privilege is very, very important in security. If a hacker comes in, you don't want them to adopt full root privileges and so forth. Now, if you don't have a user directive in your, in your Docker file, you will automatically provide root to any attacker that breaks in and uses that process. As a result, what we want to do here is create a new group. Uh, this uh, group also has an a user added to it. This user won't have a password, a home directory, a shell. It provides a user with least privileges that we need to run our app. Very important. Number three, sign and verify images to mitigate man in the middle attacks. If we don't sign an image, or if we try and pull down an image that isn't signed, there is a very, very small, there's, a, there's no way of actually verifying that that image that we are consuming is the same image that the producer uploaded to that repository. So it's extremely important uh, to test signatures. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we can use Docker certified images, which are signed images. Secondly, uh, we can also use something called Notary, which is a Docker tool, and it allows us, first of all, to sign images. And secondly, it will block us from running an image if the signature of that image is not valid. Here is the docs, uh, very, very, pretty much straightforward to use. Um, uh, there are a couple of, you know, slight things around this, but there's a V2 coming out, as Liz Rice mentioned, on the main stage. So Docker Notary is a good tool uh, to help you sign your images. Number four, find, fix, and monitor for open source vulnerabilities in the platform, in the operating system. So who does this? Well, on a recent survey that we did last year, we can see that half the people, one in two people, do not scan Docker images for open source vulnerabilities. We would like to push a lot of that as early as possible. So during development, at build time, in production, periodically during audits, doesn't really fit that DevOps constantly pushing to production. But really, we want to test this all the time as early as possible and throughout and constantly, as well as monitoring. So how can we do that? Well, uh, this is a, a SNCC sponsored talk, so you can do it with SNCC. You can just run SNCC test and SNCC test will automatically scan that image uh, and automatically tell you about all the vulnerabilities that exist in your application, in, sorry, in, your, in your Docker image. How about in deployed containers? So containers that are already live and in production. How do you find about new vulnerabilities? Well, most people say, well, not most people, close to one in two say they probably won't find out about new vulnerabilities. Some people use scanning tools, awesome. Some people use their security team, that's great. Some people track the public databases, that sounds a bit tiring. But the key here is almost one in two people don't even think about new vulnerabilities that come into their production environments. So. One thing we can do here is something called a SNCC monitor. And SNCC monitor will constantly test daily about a look at your images, and it will tell you and inform you when you have new vulnerabilities. So it will tell you straight away as and when these new vulnerabilities hit. Now we're going to do some live hacking. So here is a uh, here is a package called Image Magics. Many of you will have heard this. This is in a Debian instance, and this is an improper va uh, input validation. So input validation, we're all familiar about how if we don't trust, if we sorry, if we trust our input too much when it's from a third party, we can get into some significant trouble. So let's go terminal and actually hack this. I'm going to start off uh, by going straight to a browser. And I'm going to show you uh, a quick application that I've got running here. And this is a very straightforward uh, application. It's a node application. It uses image magic in the background. And what I can do is I can pick a file. So why don't I grab, I don't know, let's grab, uh, let's see what we have, something something fun. How about this one? This is my little puppy, Bella, uh, running on Brella. And uh, I'm going to resize that. And what that's going to do is it's going to take that image and it's going to turn it into a Twitter ideal photo size. So there we go. I can have my boop nose as my Twitter image. That's great. But what if I wanted to choose a file that was malicious? Now, let me just show you. Let me go to a terminal, in fact. 
And we're going to tell you this is the this is the Docker application running on localhost 3112. And I can show you in my exploits folder, I've got a number of files here. And I'm going to use input validation, which is going to lead me to a remote code execution. And I'll show you exactly how that looks. So if I count RTE1, we will see as part of this JPEG creation, what we're doing is we're passing in a URL, but bang, we break out straight away and we perform an OR, and then we try and touch a file, RCE1. So this is effectively poor input that is breaking out and executing this touch command on my remote Docker machine. Let me quickly jump over, uh, jump in, into my Docker instance. I am here in my Docker instance. You can't see any RCE1, but as soon as I go back over to my browser and I choose that file, RCE1, let me quickly uh, go and grab that file. Uh, here we go in my exploits directory, RCE1. I'm going to click resize on that. Bang, we don't actually get anything. Why do we not get anything? Because what this is doing is it's running that it's, it, it's running that command inside. And if I do an ls, there we go. We have a remote code execution and it's touched that file. Okay, let's do something a little bit more interesting. Let's uh, run RCE2. So let me cat that file rce2.jpg we can see we're going to do something a little bit more interesting this time using the image over command we're going to perform a w get and we're going to uh, find this r.sh file we're going to pipe that into its own file uh, from the contents and we're going to bash that file so this is a script that we're going to run so first things first what we need to do is we need to uh, let's have a look actually inside this r.sh so let's cat the r.sh, and we can see what we're going to do is a further wget when this is executed in the Docker instance. We're going to do a wget. We're going to pull a netcat, okay, from my local host at port 5000. We're going to extract that. We're going to configure it. We're going to make it, and then we're going to run netcat, which is going to cause a connection back to my machine on port 3131. So first thing I need to do is serve this directory from my local machine. So I am now serving this directory. So this is on my laptop and this r.sh is going to be pulled from my laptop over to the Docker instance. That Docker image, that's why that Docker instance is going to execute this file and pull this netcat from my local machine over to it, extract it, run it, and then it's going to try and connect to my local machine on a netcat instance. So let me uh, run netcat. Here we go. Netcat and as a listener, 3131. There's my listener running. Right, we're all set up. Let's go back. Let's resize RCE2 now. And let's watch this happen, RCE2. Okay, resize. Nothing's happening. And that's because if I come back to my application here and I do an LS here, we can see on my Docker side, R.sh has been downloaded. Netcat has been downloaded. Is this working? If I do an LS on my local machine in this Netcat listener, bang, we get the LS of that local machine. What else can I do? Maybe a, oops, maybe a PS minus EF, PS minus EF. Let's cat my ETC password. This doesn't have a user, so I'm running as root. I have root permissions. Great hack. Okay, next up, let's jump back. How am I doing for time? Eight minutes and 30 seconds. This is awesome. Okay, so let's jump straight back over to uh, Keynote and get going there. So number five, user linter. Linters are awesome. Whether you're a developer doing application work, whether you're a developer uh, you know, creating a Docker file, linters are great. They, they, they allow you to follow a set of rules uh, and, and effectively police all the developers that are trying to put code in, find mistakes and allow them to fix early. It's about Quick feedback loops and linters is excellent for that. For Halo Lint, it's a great linter that allows you to find and fix, obviously, uh, issues in your Docker file as early as you're writing them. So here we can see things like using copy instead of add for added security. There are a bunch of things that we can add in uh, into our Docker file, but potentially that are not, or, or maybe even not adding into our Docker file, which will expose uh, defaults that are insecure. Halo Lint will pick this up for us uh, and it will help us fix that. Number six, find, fix, and monitor 
application in your application your open source vulnerabilities again really really key because your application is running in your container it doesn't matter how secure your container is if your application is wide open so when we think about your application you have a small amount of code typically and what you deploy is much much bigger because you're pulling in dependencies that are open source and we can see uh, that a number of different uh, vulnerabilities can exist in indirect as well as direct and here we can see in fact, the largest number is in indirect. And I believe this is very much because of the number of indirect dependencies that are pulled in, particularly on, on ecosystems like NPM. So let's show you that. Okay, right, I'm gonna jump into my, uh, my uh, Goof application, which is again running in a container. This is a to-do application, so I can do things like buy some milk and it appears there. I have an about page which is being served from my public directory. Now I've already scanned this uh, in SNCC and everything that I'm gonna show you today in SNCC is entirely free and you can run with this on a freemium plan. So I have scanned this directly from GitHub. I can see I've searched on a directory traversal. This is a module called ST which exists in my application. Now this is very, very easy to fix. Uh, I'm currently on 024, it's fixed in 025. I can just fix this vulnerability by clicking this button. And because we, we scanned this from GitHub, this is gonna automatically send a pull request directly back to GitHub. And it will pull you up to the minimum version required to eliminate that vulnerability without pushing so far that there's gonna be you know, some migration problem. And here I can show you the file change. It very simply just pushes you up from 024 to 025. Very, very straightforward. It'll also do this for indirect because it'll upgrade your, your direct dependencies to pull in your transitive dependencies at the right version. But we haven't merged this. So let's actually hack this uh, application. We're gonna hack it because we can see this is being served by the public directory. So let's grab this. And in fact, let me grab uh, this item here. Okay, in this item, what we're gonna do is we're gonna hack this by very, very simply, uh, let's cancel that by very, very simply curling that same command. And we can see how versatile our application is. It looks just as amazing here as it did in the browser. But we're going to do some directory traversal. That means breaking out of the breaking out of a folder that we uh, are in that we perhaps should go to somewhere else where we shouldn't be. So breaking out of the public by perhaps doing a dot dot slash. In this case, ST is a good uh, library that recognizes what a directory traversal is. So we're actually redirected to the home page because it senses we're doing directory traversal. However, if I, instead of doing the dots, URL encode this to percent to E, percent to E, we can see that this URL encoding isn't picked up by the ST library. And as a result, we've broken out of this public directory. So what can we do now? Well, now we have access. Maybe let's have a look at the package JSON. Bang, package JSON. I can see all my other direct dependencies. I can break into that perhaps. Maybe I can have a look at the app.js. There we go, some source code for me. Maybe what I wanna do is go back as far as I wanna go, all the way to the root directory. Let's go all the way back. And then perhaps at this point, let's have a look at the ETC password because I didn't add a user directive. So I have root access to the system. Okay, this is a great uh, or an interesting uh, exploit uh, to an ST library, which is fixed in 0.25. So let's jump back and actually show you uh, one other thing before we finish off the presentation, and that is what we can do in SNCC to also look at your base images. I mentioned about base images. This is a scan which we ran through Docker Hub. So we just connected it to Docker Hub, pointed it to a Docker file, and you can see straight away that this is telling us which version of our, of our image we're currently on, the number of vulnerabilities, the severity breakdown of those vulnerabilities. We can have a look at what base image minor upgrade we could do, as well as a major upgrade and a number of alternative images, as well as saying how many vulnerabilities uh, you will get in each of these and the breakdown. So you can massively drop the number of vulnerabilities, including the severity here, very, very rapidly, just by making a smart switch. And developer first security is about being actionable, okay, an actionable, uh, tool is one that provides you with those with those remediations, gives you the information and the fix, not just the information. Okay, I have one minute left. So let me jump back to my slides. And I have a couple of slides left. Yes, Sam didn't believe me when I said I was going to do 20 odd slides and uh, and two, two, uh, two hacks in, 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 20, in 15 minutes. But this final uh, 
hint I'm going to give you in the last 30 seconds is to use multi-stage build for small and secure images. What does this mean? Well, we don't necessarily have to push to production the very first build that we have. Perhaps if we use Golang or maybe Java, we might have a big image with dev dependencies where we compile, where we build our application and run tests and everything. We don't want to go to production with all of those packages. We want a smaller image that we is a thin image uh, that has just the, just the libraries required to run, not necessarily build. And that is what a, this kind of uh, image will uh, provide us with, this multi-stage image. There's my summary, seven options. Um, if you want to know more about anything I've said or SNCC security scanning for packages uh, in libraries as well as containers, why don't you pop by the SNCC booth and I'll be there and we can chat and it will all be good. Thank you very much. And I hope that was awesome in 15, in 15 minutes.